experience associate here at California Botanic Garden. And I'm Grayson Fair. I'm the visiting artist at Amoca. And you are joining us today to take a live tour of the California Cultivar Garden here at California Botanic Garden to see um, some select pieces of our current exhibition, um, California Ceramic Sculpture in the California Sunshine. Um, this is a partnership with the Amoca Ceramic Studio. Mm -hmm. We have 14 local artists on display, um, over 30 installations here in the garden. And we're going to take you on a tour of just a handful of them today. Awesome. Okay, so we're going to start out with um, here at the entrance of our cultivar garden. This sculpture here, or pair of sculptures, is called Instinct 3 by the artist C.J. Jillick. So these really bright sculptures here are in a bed of sage. This particular sage is called Bees Bliss. And her work is very intentionally uh, biomorphic. You can see it um, was really representative of um, different reproductive structures um, between those two, uh, between this pair of sculptures here and it's just really bright. Um, we were talking about when we installed these sculptures, this bed of sage was not really grown up. It was pretty, pretty flat because it wasn't blooming time yet. And so yeah. we kind of walked and placed it. And now six, seven months later, we can see how much it's bloomed, all the purple sage blooms kind of blow, um, growing in behind it. Yeah, it really helps it stand out. Yeah, it just pop, really frames. Pops it out. Another thing we talked about was the relationship between the two sculptures and how yeah. important that was to the artist. As we installed it, we, we set him up and she stood back and she looked at him and, no, 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 we need to move him a little closer, face him towards each other. Yeah. So I think these are representative of sort of a, a male and a female. Yes, um, very much. And the relationship between the two was really important to her and, and how they faced each other. And, yeah, so they were like intentionally interacting. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. She said, but she looks like she's not even interested in him. And so we had to yeah. rearrange it a few yeah, different and times. Yeah, the, and the top had to point back to. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, so I think we'll move on to our next piece Excellent. here. Excellent. Excellent. Um, we have two really large pieces kind of framing the entrance to our cultivar garden here at the garden. And so um, we are approaching um, a, a piece, a group piece called Gather by artist Brandon Lomax here. And so we have a, uh, a circle, a gathering here of uh, seven different humanoid sculptures here, a variety of different colors. And so they are sort of gathering here off to um, in this corner of the path here. Yeah, and these pieces sort of, I think, are very appropriate right now mm -hmm. um, because they sort of deal with gatherings of, of humans and, and sort of a gathering of elders I heard him talk about. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also like this sort of division of technology that is happening now. You know, yeah. we're all constantly looking at our phones and communicating that way. And there's sort of this lost um, art of, of gathering humans. Human seeing, gathering. Yeah, we're seeing more and more of that now. Which Yes, and so what's special about this piece is across the path here, you can see um, another sculpture. Um, and so this is up to interpretation. Is the sculpture joining the gathering? Is that sculpture leaving the gathering? I heard a perspective the other day, someone thought that that sculpture was leading yeah. the gathering. But what's special about that, um, that specific piece is Brandon came here and collected clay from the garden and sculpted that specific uh, humanoid piece with clay here from the garden. Wow. Um, this is an exi existing piece that he's had and has shown before, but mm -hmm. that is a special little addition here for us. Um, at the garden that we are pretty excited to tell people about that yeah. it has clay from the garden. That's amazing. <laughs> That's awesome. And so we will go ahead and head inside the cultivar garden right now. All right. Our California <laughs> cultivar garden is named as such because it features a lot of different uh, plant cultivars. So mm -hmm. cultivars cultivated by different scientists to um, purposefully have different features, different colors, shapes. And so a lot of our um, Scientists here, we used to be called Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Garden, here now California Botanic Garden, have um, hybridized different California native plants. And so these cultivated species are still considered um, California natives because they are entirely genetically native. Wow. Um, even though they have been hybridized between um, different species. And that is a majority of the plants in here or is um, it just a limited? In here, yes. In here, Specifically in this, in this little okay. area that we're taking a tour of today. Okay. Um, it's named that way because we just kind of picked a spot planted <laughs> yeah. planted a lot of these different hybridized That's plants awesome. that we have in here. Um, but the rest of the garden, this is just a small little section of the garden, the rest of the 86 acres um, is still entirely California native. Okay. Not nearly as many cultivars or hybrids. So this okay. kind of is a concentrated area here. And would you say that people 
you know, these plants exist just for pure like experimental purposes or were there other like medicinal reasons that they were sort of created or? Great question. Um, so California native plants historically have a really um, important and valuable medicinal and um, edible purposes to the indigenous peoples that live um, on these lands. And so the hybridization though, I think sometimes is really just in the name of science. Yeah. And so I don't think that they were um, created for any specific, uh, for example, medicinal purpose. I think yeah. it was just um, different selections, maybe trying to achieve a different like aesthetic yeah. look. And so I think that's a lot of what we have going on in here. I think that's kind of an innate human task is right. to see how far we can go with right, it. Right, right. Evolving keep, technology. Keep pushing, yeah. keep pushing plants and, and whatever else. Absolutely. All right, here's another piece. So right here we have Stonehenge Birds um, by Janelle Lewis. And so these, she shared with me her inspiration uh, for these where she was looking at birds when she was in Stonehenge in England. And so she wanted to create them. And you can see this little guy here um, on the left hand side is sitting on a turtle. And a lot of Janelle's work has to deal with uh, memories of, of places or things. Um, so it's all really significant to her life and, and her experiences. Um, yeah. A lot of them are named after people in her life as yeah, well. Yeah, exactly. And they're, yeah. they're like almost aids. They aid her in, in, yeah. in sort of keeping these memories. And, and um, yeah, I think they're really nice. Absolutely. So these were kind of fun to install. Um, <laughs> we installed in um, late October, early November, and this plant in front of us here um, is a, a type of, um, it's called Pigeon Point. It's in the sunflower family and it was covered in bees when we were installing. <laughs> so even just putting in this nice little sign here was a task of its own. <laughs> it doesn't look all that daunting today because it's not covered, but quite the adventure installing here. <laughs> and so we'll see quite a few of Janelle's pieces today, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. We put um, a lot of her pieces that we have in the exhibit here in the cultivar garden. And I think it's kind of fitting. Her pieces we were talking about kind of incorporate different memories and people, but they are often mixed with um, animal, human, uh, different characteristics or traits. So it kind of really fits. I yeah, think, that's, her an, pieces that's are an here excellent point. Garden. Yeah, it's a cultivation of human mm -hmm. flora and fauna. Yeah, I mean, yeah, she does actually. Speaking of flora, she has a nice little tutu of flowers here yeah. on Rosie. So Rosie here was named after um, one of her daughters. And Rosie here is really large. Um, Janelle shared with us that she sculpted her with um, with her teacher, Gary Lett, who is another um, sculptor that is featured um, in this exhibit. And she said that when it came time to fire, that Rosie here was too big to fit into the kiln. So they had to cut her into three pieces. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, really, I really admire that she, um, instead of hiding a lot of the joints, like a lot of artists do when they do pieces together, she sort of exemplifies them through like this band here. It shows off that those are meeting as well as the neck band there. It's like yeah. very much a point of contact and interest. Right. I think also her work is really interesting at how it is being affected by nature as well. I mean, we've got mm -hmm. some really interesting colors and like sort of these these dark tones coming in just from, yes. just from the elements hitting it. Um, and I think it's giving it a really nice patina and aging it really well. Yeah, a lot of her pieces um, have those features. When she, when she finishes, um, sculpting, she has them on display in her yard, or a lot of them are on display in her yard. And so they came uh, right from her backyard into our backyard here. <laughs> and so a lot of them have some of that, uh, that weathering um, that you were just talking about. Yeah. It's uh, really nice to see how it interacts with the really natural yeah. um, outdoor world here. And I love how the plant has grown up and right up into it now. It's yes. really nice. And what is this? This is also a, um, a type of sage here. You can see some oh, of, really? uh, some of the, the purple, kind of periwinkle purple blooms here. This is very characteristic for sages um, that are in the salvia family that kind of have these um, these bunches of blooms going up as you go. Um, this is a pretty small example, but hummingbird sage, these structures on hummingbird sage are really large actually. Really? So all salvias kind of have this same, um, this same shape here. So it's really easy. If you see that, you can point out, hey, that's a sage. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm pretty familiar with it, but I haven't really seen this variety very much. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the structure of the leaf is really interesting too. It's like yeah. very textured. It almost looks like scales or yeah. reptilian. Absolutely, absolutely. So that's a really fun thing that we've seen um, after we installed in October and November. Not a lot of things are in bloom in the fall. And so now it's fully springtime here, April at the garden. And you can just see a lot of our plants 
growing, blooming, interacting with the sculptures in, I think, a really fun way. And it smells amazing. Too. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> really fragrant. You guys probably aren't getting that through the camera, but... We can smell it. <laughs> we can smell it. All right, we've got a Maureen Wheeler piece here. Um, so this is called Lioness. What's that? What's that? You can see she's kind of standing at attention, um, gazing over her shoulder, very attently, attentively um, looking at something going on behind her. Hmm. Yeah, and you can tell it's nice to see these these pieces, Janelle and Maureen's, next to each other like this. One, because they work closely together in the studio. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but also it's nice to see similar approaches but very different end results. Absolutely. You know, you've got someone that works like Janelle, which is very loose and, and quick, yeah. where Maureen is more precise and uh, has really nice sharp line qualities to right. it and smooth surfaces. Right. We were talking a little bit earlier that uh, Maureen is an architect Mm -hmm. And so a lot of her pieces, she does a lot of vetting to make sure that her pieces, especially larger ones, are going to be structurally sound. Yeah. That's pretty important, um, pretty important aspect of her uh, creation process. Yeah, and she approaches it like an architect would too, yeah. right? It makes maquettes and yes. makes little models and to make sure that these things are going to work out. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's nice to see how people work very yeah. differently in the same medium. Absolutely. I think it's great. Yeah. And this one, I think the placement is really nice too because it's... It's sort of in this, especially on a sunny day, it's not yeah. so sunny today, but it's like sort of sunbathing in this yeah. little, like there's a patch shade here, but it's it's right on the edge here in this sort of more open space. Absolutely. And hers was fun too. She initially had a different spot in the garden, completely different spot in really? the garden picked out. It was actually up on a hillside, but really, really shaded. Oh. And when we put it up there, it was just not working. It, mm. it was getting lost in her opinion. Yeah. So we kind of drove all over the garden to really <laughs> find a nice spot. And sunbathing, I think is the perfect Yeah point that you just made because it's totally juxtaposed against what we originally had she was under a really heavy shade cover so it yeah. just really kind of fits in nicely here well, that context is really interesting I yeah think it's you know the artist vision is really important and that's mm -hmm. great that she got to realize it here absolutely yeah yeah that's great yeah all right so we'll head down here the cultivar garden is really really beautiful because it's not just straight lines of different paths we have a lot of um a lot of different winding paths if you look at it on a map it's actually very circular we have a lot of winding paths i was throughout. a little confused at first when i saw the map it's like okay which way do i go <laughs> exactly so we'll head over here okay. we have um telophase by david kitty and i love this one again we can't see it so much today but in um, around the five six o'clock time right now golden hour it's is beautiful it just glitters and glistens and it just looks wet in that golden hour um sun exposure and it's just beautiful yeah david's work is really phenomenal uh, he's he's professor at chapman university chapman, yes yeah yeah and a lot of his work i think is really interesting because it it deals with this idea of of change and expectation which which i was reading about recently it's like he doesn't want he doesn't ever want to have his intentions fully realized. He wants right. a bit of surprise, which is kind of innate with ceramic. Yeah. You can always intend something, but you're never going to know exactly how it's going to look. Right. But he, he puts a lot of intention towards that not knowing. Right, right. You know? and, and I think it's really important with the work, too. Um, and sort of the negative spaces in here are really mm -hmm. interesting. And yeah. Yeah, I love this one. So the name telophase is interesting because it really is, um, it really looks like uh, telophase. Telophase is kind of uh, that last step in uh, the div division of a cell, cell uh -huh. division. Yeah. You have prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. That really is the last wow, stretching, okay. splitting off between um, two, yeah, two cells, one cell turning into, uh, dividing into two cells. And so this is just like a hunk of telophase. Okay. <laughs> it is happening. Yeah. Um, all over and, and that's just as awesome. I think the work is pretty apparent too as far as um, the intention and, and uh, you know it's about like what you said and cells divide in bacteria and yeah, viruses exactly and I think that reads like almost exactly innately it reads that mm -hmm. you know yeah there is something like very yeah biological biological to it. good yeah good point. very yeah. Um, very interesting and yeah one of my favorites to look at and I imagine it changes a whole lot in the sunshine too and, yes. and depending on the light like right now it's very i'm seeing a lot of orange in it you know yeah yeah that probably has to do with the sort of neutral lighting that's out right now but i can imagine yeah. when i've seen it before i saw it more as blue exactly blue and blue and green but um so it's really nice to see it in this light and in the sun it's just glistening gold yeah. just glistening golden it looks wet and it's cool you can see that the glaze is like actively not actively dripping but there is a yeah. dripping 
element to it, which I love that it stayed that way. Yeah. Um, and that's something that he, you know, probably intended, but there's a certain amount of control that you, you just have to let go right, you know, right. and hope for the best. Right. You know? And I and think it totally worked out for the best. Totally, it just looks totally. glistening. Yeah. yeah. Dripping in the sunshine. It just, it just, it glows. Mm. Yeah. And what's this, uh, what's this plant behind it here with these long yes. purple flowers? Off to the left here, that is called a uh, woolly blue curl. And it's named um, because if you look at it, it's really soft, fuzzy, um, woolly, it has a really woolly appearance. Yeah. So this is a super sturdy plant. Mm -hmm. um, it's springtime, so it makes sense that it's blooming right now, but you'll see this plant even through the summer. It's really sturdy, really, really drought resistant and heat resistant. Normally when summer comes in, it kind of, uh, you could say burns the plants, you know, springtime mm -hmm. of flowers. When it gets too hot, our flowers are kind of done with that cycle yeah. and we move into summertime. But it's just so hardy. It's kind of um, one of the few colors you can see here in the summertime. And was this piece intentionally placed by this plant? Because they have very similar qualities, like these sort of uh, sort of balls on it. You yeah. know, it's like I feel like it's really nice to have these pieces. It's this piece next to the plant. A really good point because we really didn't actually intentionally really? put it next to this woolly blue curl. No, we just thought yeah. that this was a really nice elevated um, mound here in the cultivar garden to put a piece up on a pedestal, but I'm super pleased that it turned out being next to yeah. woolly blue curl with those same spherical features. And, and also this here is this man. Is this, this is a manzanita. This is yeah. manzanita here. Yeah. So manzanita oh, look, come in a lot some. of different varieties. Let's see. We have a little bit of blooms. Where are the blooms? A little bit of those bell shaped oh, yeah. blooms. Manzanita is a um, winter, a winter blooming plant. So right now you see a lot of the fruits mm -hmm. on those green, green spheres there are actually the fruits of the manzanita and uh, they are all really different. I think that a lot of us probably think of manzanita, we think trees, uh -huh. but that's a really good example of a, a ground cover yeah. manzanita. So it's not tall and tree-like, it's actually low to the ground. Um, again, probably selected, probably cultivated. <laughs> <for that laughs> They've purpose. got a really interesting quality with that sort of red halo on mm -hmm. the outside of their leaf. Yeah. They're like, they have a really subtle beauty. If you just yeah. glance at them, they're just like a, a bush, right? Yeah, yeah. But then when you start to study them, there's some really amazing qualities to them. Are we going that, this we'll way here? This way here. And that red kind of matches with that red bark too. Yeah, yeah. Manzanita. If you want a trick, if you ever want to impress anybody, all you have to do is look at that nice, smooth, burgundy red bark and say, that's a manzanita. I know, I know plants. Manz I know what a manzanita <laughs> is. <laughs> exactly. So uh. right here, a little bit more tree-like as you can see. But that's my favorite trick here is, oh yes, that's a manzanita. I knew mm. that. <laughs> and can you tell me about this? What is this here? That is a super good question. Let's see, I'm trying to see if we have a, a name plaque here for it. And I'm not seeing one, but just a nice tall, um, really evergreen tree here that you can see. It actually reminds me a lot of the piece that we're about to see next. Exactly. Right? It's kind of like foreshadowing yeah. what we're what, about, what, to, what what's we're about to see here. What's next, people? <laughs> what's next is um, asparagus by Janelle Lewis. All right. And so these, um, this, these um, sculptures here, these four stalks of asparagus, were really intentionally placed in this bed of agave because asparagus and agave are actually in the same family. The Latin name is asparagaceae, mm. asparagus. And so it was kind of a <laughs> no-brainer when we we're walking around and we we're like, okay, where are we going to put these different pieces? Asparagus, no-brainer, was going back in here um, yeah. behind the agave. Yeah, I mean, and they're really similar. You can Not all plants that look similar are necessarily related, Yeah, but these ones you can definitely tell are related by yeah. the... Um, the, the the leaflets kind of coming into a spike. They just yeah. look really similar. Yeah, the center point of these agave have very much the top of an asparagus look yeah, here. Yeah, absolutely. Got these leaves folding over each other. And so when asparagus, um, not asparagus, when the agave <laughs> blooms, <laughs> when the agave blooms, it looks like a stalk of asparagus. When, yeah. we were, when we were installing or when we selected this spot, we had a huge long stalk um, of the agave bloom that kind of arched over where we're standing right now, mm. um, like in a nice little arch. And it really, um, now that the asparagus are here, it looked like, it's kind of what it looked like kind of before it arched its way over. So these were just kind of meant to be yeah. here. Yeah, and I'll tell you a bit about how these pieces were made. They're the conglomerate pieces. So again, Janelle makes by stacking work. Um, so these pieces were probably made separately and, and then joined later on. And as you can tell, there's a variety of color throughout the pieces. Um, that just deals, that's again, back to what we were talking about, this sort of intention versus reality. Yeah. Right, right. You know, you can always expect things, but clay is always going to do what it wants. Right. Um, but the, very, the variety in this piece makes it more interesting to me. I think if the pieces were all the same exact color, it would have just kind of blend in, blended in. But it's nice to see this variety here and 
sort of conglomerate piece. Yeah, so can you tell us about these different colors? Because I thought that she glazed one of them green, glazed one of them a purple color, but it turns out those colors happen based on where they're located and where they're fired in the kiln. Yeah, I would imagine that there's three different glazes that she's using. So there's the sort of heart like that green in the back, so uh -huh. that green to brown there. Uh -huh. They might be the same as these green ones here, Okay. but I think the purple ones, uh, the, the reddish purple ones are all the same glaze. Um, and the different spots in the kiln has to do with the sort of translucity or the opacity of mm -hmm. the glaze. So the one on top has like much more of a, a rich sort of opaque color. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would imagine that uh, the pieces underneath it might have been in a different spot where okay. there was more uh, more fuel than air, a sort of a reduction atmosphere. Okay. So a lot of times those colors get a little more bleached yeah. like that. Um, I'm not sure about the green though. But I know that that green in the back is actually Wright's green. I know that glaze well. It's in almost okay. every clay studio. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the variety of it is really nice to see the, the change in there. And yeah, I think this piece is really strong. Yeah, that's awesome. And I love, I love this one on the left. See how it has that crooked, it right. kind of goes up like that. I think that's really interesting and nice. Right, right. Yeah. And they just kind of all fit together. Yeah. There's so much texture. It's really interesting to look at. Different color, different opacity, different textures yeah, totally. of all the different pieces. It's just really interesting. Every single different point that you look at it, it's, it's different every time. Mm. It's awesome. Yeah. All right. all right. So we'll head over here to our next pieces in a little patch of desert, if you will, here mm. in the cultivar garden. Um, it's on a, uh, it's a little bit elevated um, on a ground, on, on a mound of gravel. Okay. And we have a few different um, types of cactus behind it that really perfectly frame this piece, I think. Agreed, agreed. So um, up next here, we have Listen Up by Heidi Creechit. And um, we were talking earlier about how the, the, the details in, in this piece here just perfectly match this totem pole cactus behind it. It's just kind of, it's, it's, it's facing, it's oriented the same way. This, uh, this pinched out layer here, if you will, I think just really perfectly matches yeah. the cactus behind it. And some of the aggression too, or not the aggression, but sort of the action that you can see. Uh, her work, sh the way she makes is very much in the moment. Yeah, um, it's, yeah. It's not super planned. Right. Um, but that sort of these, these aggressive marks here really speak to the cactus around it yeah. and the harshness of it. Absolutely. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about how this piece was made or yeah. how it was fired. Um, this was a wood fired piece. Um, so wood firing is a process where you load up a kiln um, specifically meant to burn wood okay. and you burn wood for maybe, you know, sometimes it's two to 10 days wow, where, okay. you, where you fire this kiln. Um, so a lot of the pieces go in raw and so mm -hmm. you can see some of the raw elements of the clay down here. So if this was fired just in a regular gas kiln, this whole piece would be around this color here. But since it was fired in a wood kiln, there's a certain atmosphere created, which changes the, the clay body. Yeah. But also as wood burns, ash flies through the kiln, lands on the piece and melts it. Yeah. And so this is the result of a ton of wood that right, was right. burned and melted on there. Right. Um, so this is a really fascinating piece. And yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't know that there was a difference. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, between the two different types of um, or different types of kilns. Yeah, so anytime you see something that has like a wide variety, especially earth tones, mm -hmm. these neutral colors, yeah, you can bet that it was sort of an atmospheric. Yeah, um, and a lot of people read this as just brown. Okay, um, but once you look closer, there's a whole range of colors. Yeah, and these nice earth tones, and and it really reflects uh, the material of the yeah. clay. I think that's really important. Um, you know, it's just these reddish browns to these yellow grays. Yeah, it's really nice. It almost looks like, and correct me if I'm wrong, it almost looks like like tar down here almost, right? Where that kind of dark... Yeah, it's a little toastier yeah. down there. Yeah, yeah. And so that, that was actually, this would be a little more protected. Oh, okay. So um, this side was probably the side towards the flame. Okay. Whereas this side was facing away from it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Awesome. That's but yeah, what a, what a fitting piece for this yeah. spot here. Absolutely. Again, yeah. we took a walk through the garden and some of the artists were more or less familiar with the garden. Uh -huh. but um, it just really fit in who was gonna who was gonna put which piece where it just really came together We had a general idea of where yeah. we wanted to uh, keep the exhibit contained uh -huh. um, We have a really large area out in the back of the garden 54 acres Wow, um, with not a lot of coverage that we were avoiding um, But it just really perfectly everybody just laid their pieces out perfectly hmm. in here. Yeah, I agreed. Yeah 
So we have a little bit of a ways to our um, next piece here that we're going to cover. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about um, your residency at the ceramic studio? Sure. Yeah. So I'm the visiting artist in Amoka, which means um, Amoka was awarded the Wingate Grant. Um, okay. So it provides a funded year for two artists. Awesome. Um, it's a pretty sweet deal. Yeah. <laughs> so I get to come to Amoka as the visiting artist, and I just uh, am provided with a studio space, yeah. living situation, and I just get to make work yeah. all the time. It's really nice. That's awesome. And I'm still pretty new. I've been here six months. Okay. Um, so I've been enjoying the city in California yes. before I was in Arizona, so it's a nice change to yes. be here. Um, but yeah. Awesome. Yeah, it's been really nice. Um, I'm kind of there as just a, you know, I'm not really responsible for anything in particular, but okay. people come to me with questions, which yeah. is really, really fun and nice yeah. and get to sort of just be the person around, you know? Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. So you have another six months, yep. give or take left? Yep. Okay. Yep. I'll be heading out in October. Okay, great. That's awesome. Yeah. To kind of visit, see a different area, different studio space. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. So I've been doing residencies for the past three or four years and, okay. and it's kind of one year here and one yeah. year there and it's a really great way to get around and make new friends and yeah. see great places and totally yeah i'm lucky i'm lucky to be where i am for right. sure that's awesome and so yeah. are you creating your own work i mean at the same time because you get studio space yeah right? that's kind of a yeah I'm, I'm sort of that's sort of my responsibilities is right, to make right, my okay. work um yeah. which is really cool you know awesome yeah all right that's really cool all right next here um another one of janelle lewis's pieces is uh what we're coming up here on it's called a rabbit and so this is kind of one of the first pieces we were um we decided on uh when we were looking at having um making uh california an exhibit here so this is rabbit um the the inside scoop is that this is her husband's favorite piece <laughs> she said oh great if we put it in there her husband will for sure come it's her it's his favorite piece. <laughs> so that is awesome luring him in huh? yes exactly well th that's actually an interesting way to put it because i feel this piece definitely lures you in yeah um, I don't know if you can tell on the on the camera, but we had to walk through some foliage, very much like a cave entrance in here. We are. We're in a cave of three redwoods here. Yeah. Three small redwood trees. It's a very inviting piece, um, I think, to come and interact with. We were talking earlier about the the feet. Janelle has really detailed pieces um, or de detailed um, parts of her pieces, and the feet really seem to be an important detailed part of a lot of her sculptures here yeah yeah it's a it's a really nice balance between humanoid yeah. and animal uh, yeah. features but i think those feet really are a really strong aspect of this piece right and it's funny too it's a really kind of neutral neutral palette but we have a really nice bright bird up here with the blue and the yellow i think just really pops yeah on the rabbit's shoulder here yeah compared to the you know the rest of the rest of the tones yeah, and again, we're seeing a sort of natural patina on this work, um, which I think accentuates, like if you look in the toes, you know, you've got all those sort of dark features in there, which just make the surface pop more, Right. you know? Right. This piece really is like, makes me want to come sit here yeah. and, and like meditate in front of this. And right, just like, same thing, cross a leg. Yeah, and cross a leg yeah, and seat, just have a, a leg. have a staring contest. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so this one's a fun one. Again, it was kind of one of the first pieces we picked, and it's been featured on most of our um, mm -hmm. most of our promo or promotion materials, um, a lot of our advertisement to get folks here to come see California. Rabbit is kind of um, one of the main featured sculptures here, and it's really, really um, interesting and different. I like the little cross-stitch detailing here, um, yeah. kind of on, the, on the, the bust of her dress there. Yeah. It's just really interesting. What, really that, what does that piece. bird mean to you? What do you think about that bird? That's just a really good question. Um, I just, it really strikes me, the color, the brightness of the color, mm -hmm. the, the really bright yellow and blue strikes me sitting on the shoulder. I don't know, you were talking about maybe a serenity, peaceful, meditative feeling, and maybe this, you know, light, bright bird. I picture it as a songbird singing, maybe. Mm. Um, just kind of comes into the space and just kind of um, reiterates that positive feeling. Interesting. Yeah. I almost read that bird. I mean, I'm not totally sure her, in, her intention. But right, right. I almost read it the opposite way. Really? Yeah. Do it's tell. like, it's like, well, you've got this sort of really neutral tones mm -hmm. and this sort of peaceful piece and then you've got this bright bird on your shoulder. Yeah. And it's like, while you're trying to 
while you're trying to sit down and enjoy a peaceful moment, you've always mm -hmm. got this thing chirping this on your shoulder. This loud thing on your yeah, shoulder. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> hey, what about this? What about your? What about that stuff that you forgot to do? You know? Absolutely. So. Absolutely. That's funny. I mean, I really, I do see that. I yeah. see it. That's very funny. And can you tell us about the redwoods a bit here? This is my first time seeing redwoods. Yes, actually. welcome, Grayson. Redwoods. Wow. <laughs> so, um, we really shouldn't have redwoods here. Redwoods are um, not here in Southern California. Claremont, uh, we are on the outskirts of LA County, and so, we shouldn't have redwoods down here. It's too hot and too dry. Redwoods usually you're gonna find, um, you know, along the coast and even inland um, up in central California, you know, the redwood forest, mm -hmm. um, big Sur is where you're gonna find them. And, you know, for those of us that have been there, massive, absolutely massive, the most, um, I think they're the most massive um, uh, plants in, um, Southern California, I mean, in California, yeah. California native. Yeah. And so we are super lucky to have these here. They are um, relatively small because they are um, a, under some constraints here, um, temperature and water are yeah. <laughs> the main constraints. There's kind of limiting factors here um, for them. They are not growing as massive as they do up along the central coast. I wonder if the, uh, the earth too around here has uh, anything to do with it. Yes, you know what, this, this whole area we're on here, the cultivar garden is located on our Indian Hill Mesa. Um, which is actually just a um, a mesa of clay. Really? Funny enough. So I'm I'm not sure how it interacts. Um, if it's happy in the clay or hmm. limited in the clay. Um, Interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Interesting. Um, but yeah, so they're they're small, albeit small. We're super lucky to have them here. We have just these few, that rabbit, um, these few that kind of are congregating around the rabbit, and then we have another little um, forest section of um, much more redwoods over there that we'll go yeah, check. Yeah, we'll out. go check those out. But yes, lucky to have them, and um, sometimes they can struggle when it's too hot. We, have, we had an infamous day a few summers ago that was 115 degrees. Yeah. Everybody remembers it, and um, <laughs> a little too warm here. <laughs> a little too warm for the redwoods, but for the most part, they are doing relatively okay. And these are conifers. Did but they do they make do they make pine cones? Do they make what what kind of? That is, uh, you know, what a really good question. Um, we have a lot of. Um, a lot of varying sizes of pine cones here. We mm -hmm. have um, a Jeffrey pine, for example, has the Ooh, largest pine cone. Pause here too. Yeah. Oh, let's talk about these yeah, here. Yeah, we um, want to talk about these. Our, our Douglas iris. We have a lot, um, a lot of different Douglas iris um, out and about right now um, in the garden. Most of the time, you'd think of. I'm trying to see if we have any purple ones over here. Most of the time, you probably would think of an iris as purple with the white and yellow detailing mm -hmm. inside, kind of in the inside the petals but these ones right back here are white with purple and yellow detailing and i love looking at them the inside of the petals it just looks like a watercolor the way that the purple just kind of fades spreads into blue yeah the detail is really striking in there i mean i just the think it looks like a watercolor painting and, it's yeah. just so beautiful there yeah and so we have a lot of these again they're only here for the springtime i wish they were here all year and these are uh these come back every year, right? You don't oh, need yes. to. Yeah, yeah. We have a lot of them, um, and they come back every year. You'll kind of see we have clusters planted. We have some kind of over behind us, over there too. We'll walk by those in a minute. Oh yeah, that's but, really um, lovely. A lot of different varieties of colors in Douglas Iris, but um, they're all beautiful and they're um, really visible. So when you're looking for color in the garden, they'll kind of stand out and hit you because they're yeah. purple with that yellow punch in the middle. Yeah, it's really beautiful. Really nice. All right, so we have another Janelle piece here. Another Janelle piece here. This is Jane's Rabbit. Uh, not the rabbit, I'm sorry, we just said the rabbit. Jane's Rat. And so um, Jane named after um, one of her grandkids, and she made it um, in the year of the rat. So that's where the name comes from. Okay. And so you can't see, it's tucked behind us, but um, she actually sculpted a uh, small little iPhone, a cell phone, that is sticking out of the top of the rat's um, back pocket in there. So that's you, kind of a fun detail. You see from the other side, if you were to walk up and yeah. view it from the other side. Do you, you have any uh, uh, guesses or do you know why that cell phone is there? Do you know what it means? That, I don't, I don't. Hmm. I wonder if it's, I don't know. My own speculation would be, um, yeah, you know, the telling it. of time. Okay. I don't know. I just think like in the 21st century here, cell Cell phones on sculptures might not seem totally out of the ordinary because as people we are glued to our phones yeah and so i think that you know several sculptures uh just only a couple decades back wouldn't have um cell phones because we didn't have cell phones <laughs> i like that interpretation because i mean her work is a lot about sort of documentation of yeah. of her existence yeah so, so as time changes and how that becomes like integral to you know you leave the house like make sure my phone's Where's there my phone? yeah. <laughs> it's, it's funny that a sculpture even has a yeah um 
I think this piece is interesting in comparison to the last one where we mm -hmm. were talking about how inviting yeah. the last one was yes. in those trees. Yeah. I get sort of the opposite feeling from this one. I get a, so not necessarily like an uninviting, but I mm -hmm. sort of get an eerie feeling. And maybe it's the rat face. Yeah. And maybe, yeah. maybe it's the distance. There's a rope here that we can't cross and it's seeing it from a distance among these towering trees with this obscured yes. foliage here. I think it really makes for a, a, an eerie feeling. It's kind of an elusive, in, yeah. In, yeah, the rat face. I mean, look at those teeth. <laughs> They're very yeah. and um, the way And the way it's prominent. holding its, its stomach as well, like right. maybe it's in pain or maybe it's, you know, I think, I think yeah. it's really interesting. It's funny, you know, we really wanted it to be um, under the redwoods. So we yeah. were we placed it um, intentionally under so it could be framed by all these redwoods, but it intentionally or unintentionally created that type of distance between us. And we had to put the rope up because it was <laughs> inviting people yeah. to go in and trample um, this, I don't know if anybody can tell here, a little bed of California native strawberries. And so a lot of people uh, maybe couldn't necessarily tell that these strawberries were growing. Again, yeah. we opened the exhibit in, um, in November, so they weren't as lush yeah. and uh, and uh, as grown in as they are right now. And so we kind of had to rope it off <laughs> to keep people on the trip, yeah. not inside the plant bed. But, and, um, and these yeah. are and these are native, right? These are California. a native California strawberry. Yummy. And so most of the most of what you can see right here is green, but you can see some of these little white blooms here. And we walked by a patch of strawberries earlier that did actually have some small itty bitty little green strawberries growing in the fruit itself i'm not seeing any here just no, the but these the, fl the flowers will be pollinated and mm -hmm. then and then into strawberries oh correct? yes yeah correct and, and so they are you, edible and if you look at the back of them the flowers i think you see a little bit of like green there mm -hmm. and that's the end of a strawberry you always yep. are picking off where you eat it I don't know. so fun yeah yes yeah, so these are native i mean they are edible um i haven't tried them myself but maybe i'll um sneak out here in the summer uh, when the berries actually come through and uh, report back to you guys. <laughs> yeah, so very fun. You can see um, kind of up here in front of us, we actually have a really large, uh, nice uh, field, if you will, um, of these different um, irises. And so mm. there's actually some pretty deep purple yeah. um, to our left right there. Um, just a really, really wide variety of colors that we have here. Mm. And then um, another favorite off to our right Ooh. This is um, a California lilac. Um, Cenothus is the Latin name, and I just love these. They have a really wide range wow. of color. I've seen some that are white, um, that are called snow flurry, and then um, all types of different blue to lavender to even like a true purple. So it's, um, yeah, it's common name is known as California lilac. This one here is Cenothus Ernie Bryant, um, so named after. Um, Again, named Ernie Bryant, but I just love these. They're so soft, they're so fragrant, and the colors, the different variety of colors they come in, um, because there are so many different um, cultivars of um, the California lilac, they just have a really wide range of colors. Mm. I just love them. Yeah, yeah, I love the, the conglomerate mm -hmm. sort of creating form through multiple little tiny little petals. Yes, I mean, it, little bunches. So yeah. what would you, if you could guess what what kind of insect would pollinate? So it has yes. to be something smaller, right? Um, or... Yes, this is usually covered in our um, native bumblebees. Okay. It's not even that European honeybee that we think of as bees. Yeah. They're on here too, but I usually see they're really cute, round, fluffy. Okay. Um, California native bees. Oh, and awesome. so those are actually kind of some big boys. They're really? actually pretty, so... yeah, yeah. So I'd say the bee itself might be the size of wow. this here, the tip. And I so guess, this is normally yeah, covered. Yeah. Normally covered, actually, yeah. in bees. Um, I wonder if the weather is kind of playing, um, the kind of gloomy sure. weather is playing into that today, but usually yeah. it's alive and buzzing with um, nice fluffy bees. And I'm sure a lot of other insects, I've seen different types of beetles on here too, but cool. bees, I think, are going to be kind of that paramount um, paramount pollinator we have yeah. on California lilac. Yeah, and that's interesting that you mentioned about the sort of European bee. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, how many... I mean, how many native species of bee are there around here? Do you know? I mean, yeah, that's a great question. I'm not actually sure of the number, but I know that when I think most of us think of bees, we think of a European honeybee, uh -huh. which um, are everywhere. They do a lot of pollinating. Yeah. But we have um, we have several types of native um, California bumblebees, and so I think one has a little bit more of a yellow fuzzy patch on okay. the top of his head, and then another variety of a native um, bumblebee has more of a black patch okay. um, on the top of his head. Interesting. Thing. And I'm not quite sure what the names of those are, but um, I know that I've seen them. <laughs> Big and, and fuzzy I just can refer back, refer back to the photo. Okay, yeah. does this have that yellow fuzzy patch on its head, or is it the black fuzzy patch? Yeah. 
and then that's how you, that's how you can tell Interesting. <laughs> which, Interesting. which ones there are but there are actually a lot of um, invasive um, bees as well and so they do do pollination work but they um, compete with our native bee yeah, species that's what I've heard and these invasive species are invasive they're not native to here so they don't have a natural predator oh, no. to keep their population in check so they can compete with and sometimes out compete our native yeah. species yeah. and this kind of this goes for plants and other animals as well not just the bees but yeah. um yeah so these invasive um invasive bees can actually out compete our native bees and the native bees were made to pollinate our native plants yeah. and so we want to save the bees but save the native bees save the right here bees, in california right? not yes. just not just the honeybees yeah we yeah want yeah we want those kinds. bumblebees and they're so oh they're just so cute they <laughs> sting you they just are so fuzzy they're so cute all right, we've got another plant we want to talk about here, right? Yes, this is a really fun one. So this is um, a variation, a variety of flannel bush. Fremontodendron is um, the genus name of flannel bush. And these are really interesting. So they're named flannel bush because there is like a fuzzy flannel soft appearance to it. But I would not uh, recommend touching these bad boys. These are known for being super irritating, <laughs> that, um, that, that, fl that fuzzy flannel. When it gets you, it's always like, oh no, I just brushed up against a flannel bush. You're usually in for two or three days of irritation mm. minimum. Contact dermatitis is what that causes. Yeah. This is a, um, a selection called California Glory. And, uh, you know, flannel bush is just really beautiful. Inside the flower, you guys all got a close up a second ago. It's a really waxy appearance and it really actually holds the water. We were talking about that earlier. Mm -hmm. it, the shape of the plant is like a bell or a cup almost. And so it's a really waxy, smooth appearance inside, but you can see the collected water in there. Um, and we were, uh, we were wondering aloud earlier, does that, does that feed insects? Does that feed birds? Really good question. Yeah, maybe it's that I don't a, know the answer to. <laughs> maybe it attracts attracts birds just to further encourage pollination. Yeah, you know, and it's, things it's, to drink, you know. And it's so common too that um, you know leaves especially lose um, water from the bottom the bottom of um, the leaf. We have these um, these stomata, and that's how a plant loses its water. So I don't know if it's kind of hanging onto some water in there. Interesting. Pure it's conjecture. Drinking. I don't know that for a fact. <laughs> um, these are California Glory, and then the one behind us is a different um, different type of color variation. It's called their Fremontodendron Pacific Sunset. Hey, the sun's coming out. Yeah, look at that peak out here. And so these are, again, you can see nice um, reddish orange um, in the middle of the flower here that kind of spreads out into a yellow. Mm. And so these different cultivars are interesting with the fact that they have that orange that then kind of um, spreads out up into yellow because I would say like a really classic Fremontodendron flannel bush. It's just a really solid yellow. Just solid true primary yellow and so i really love these um these um hybridizations here that have that orange inside and uh pacific sunset specifically was um introduced here um from okay. uh, we were previously called rancho santa Ana botanic garden uh -huh. now we're claremont botanic garden so this in the nursery trade is known as an rsabg introduction because we um introduced it and so these you can see it takes up almost this whole plant bed here yeah these two premontodendron together they just grow massive and again, wow, they're yeah, really they're sturdy. tall too. Huh? Really tall, really sturdy, really hardy. Wow. And so they bloom in the springtime. Um, oh, we got some bees flying around yes, too. Yes, I mean, you see, can see some of those bees here. They're coming out for the sun. The sun's coming out. They're happy. They're going to yeah. do some pollinating for us. And it's, what is this? So right purple. here, yes, this Magenta. purple one is tucked in here. It's a uh, western wow. bud, I believe. Um, so there are some, this is kind of, um, Kind of small in here there are some in the garden that are just really really bright striking magenta yeah and this one still has a lot of um a lot of um green foliage here it's not totally covered in that magenta purple i love how that there's just the tiniest pink line on the outside of these leaves yeah that it sort of matches reflects the the quality of the flower yeah Wonderful. yeah so it's kind of funny it's kind of grown right up in here so kind of um kind of um interweaving between on um, the flannel bush here they have great they have and that when they're really big really sturdy they grow large we kind of let them do their thing and they yeah. kind of weave interweave and grow in, grow in between each other it's awesome wow the purple looks really nice i think against the totally the orange and the yellow and so we do have um one last Whoa. sculpture up here around what are we the looking at and we have a lot of um a lot of different salvia here that we're going to pass by though mm -hmm. on the way Here's actually another one of those California lilac. Different color here. That oh, yeah. one we saw was kind of a deeper blue, yeah. almost leaning towards purple. And this is a nice little soft light blue lavender. Yeah. 
And this was a larger one too. Again, we were talking about the manzanita. Some are a little bit more ground cover, smaller shrubs, and some are larger trees. Yeah, this one, this, does the this, same thing. this one feels more like a tree. It definitely, definitely is a tree. Yeah, so yeah. I love these. Again, normally covered in bumblebees. It smells nice, too. Yeah, mm. yeah they really Even do. through this mask, I can smell. I know, it's really interesting that you can, you know, yeah. you smell. Some of these things are so strong. Speaking of strong, white sage right here. Um, Salvia apiana is going to be the strongest. Give a little, little rub and smell. Oh, the man. Strongest, wow. Little, I love sage. One the strongest one. So white sage, um, really mm. sacred uh, for the indigenous people, Tongva, mm -hmm. um, that um, we are on um, Tongva land here. So white sage is just so, so important and sacred. It has its medicinal and edible uses. And again, you can just see it's so sturdy um, with the, the leaves right here. It's not quite blooming yet. Um, it will have some blooms a little bit later on. Um, you can kind of see it in the background. Oh yeah, look at here. those. That same kind of segmented um, bloom. Yeah. Um, blooms up there. I'm not quite blooming yet, but then there's some woody, um, kind of some woody characteristics. Yeah. Too. So really um, yeah, it's a nice sturdy, um, really sturdy plant here that grows all over. We see it all over and it's really, really strong yeah. too. So yeah, I've uh, uh, I spent some favorite. time in New Mexico where yeah. you look out over the landscape and it's entirely sagebrush as yeah. far as you can see. Awesome. Yeah. It's awesome. We have so many different types of salvias in here and it's just, I think kind of quintessential California native. It's yeah. just so useful and the smell is just mm. so distinct, really memorable. Yeah. It's really important here to the California native landscape here. And let's see, right here in front of us, we have um, our last stop um, for our live tour today. Um, this is another Heidi Creechit piece. It's called Inkwell. Inkwell. Love this work. Yes. Um, so again, this is a wood-fired piece. Yeah. Um, and if we can get a full round of it, you can see that there's a wide variety of surface on here. Um, so the piece that we saw earlier was maybe a little further back from the fire. This one was clearly buried in fire. Okay. So we can see this layer of crust, almost like it was underwater for years. Um, there was probably coal beds built up so so big around. This thing might have been totally covered at one point in, wow. in an, a bed of coals. And um, then it burns down and then you build it up again, it burns down and you get this wide variety of color and surface. I mean, on this side, we've got browns to reds to grays. And then if you come over here, we've got yellow and greens and a little bit of blue in there. And I love, I love how the texture breaks the color too in mm -hmm. here. I think that's really interesting there. And again, this piece went into the kiln raw. So this right. is all just the clay body and yeah. the fire and the type of wood that's used. That's Very impressive. Yes. I think we were talking earlier about how at first glance, oh yeah, earth tones. But again, earth tones. when you really, all, all those colors that you just listed off right there are just, yeah so visible, so interesting, and so um, unplanned. Uh -huh. It's such a surprise. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, That's each awesome. each firing is different and it's, you know, somewhat rec uh, like repl replicable, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but never, never exactly the same. Right. Yeah, so that's really interesting. Right, yeah, this one's a great one here. So interesting, so, yeah. Yeah, so many different textures to look at. And again, it's really nice to see this kind of work uh, as opposed to some of the other works we've seen where they're more uh, concise and, mm -hmm. and precise. Right. Whereas this, you can feel feel a lot from the piece. You can see yeah. that there was action there and there yeah. was, you know, the sort of letting go while, yeah. while making. Um, yeah, this is a great piece. Yeah, it's great. All right. All right. Well, I think that is um, wrapping up our um, live tour here yeah. um, from California in the California Cultivar Garden. Yeah. We are um, planning on doing another one of these next month um, in May. So keep an eye out and register for that when the mm -hmm. registration link is sent out. Yeah. Um, Amoka will send it out as well as California Botanic Garden. Yeah. So you can join us for round two. And we'll cover <laughs> of, um, uh, live. <laughs> cover a lot of other work as well. A lot of different kinds of work. It'll be really interesting. I think. Yeah. To see. Yeah. Some different artists. We have yeah. kind of the same few artists kind of scattered into this area so next month we're going to cover some artists that um, yeah. we did not get to see today yeah. yet so if anybody's interested in coming and seeing the exhibition for yourself um california botanic garden we are here open tuesday through sunday 8 a.m to 6 p.m you can purchase tickets ahead of time on our website www.calbg.org you can also purchase them at the door and again beautiful right now i think april march through may but april specifically is the best time to visit the garden it's 
a rainbow of colors in here. Yeah, it's every, really, really gorgeous. Everything is just blowing up with color right now. It's beautiful here. Come check Absolutely. it out. Absolutely. Yeah. And then definitely check out Amoka's website. They have oh, um, a lot yeah. of fun virtual resources going on right Excellent, now as yeah. well. Yeah, come check us out. Yes. All right. Thanks so much. Hope everyone Bye. enjoys their week. <laughs>